Choir and ensemble, thank you all for leading us, leading us this morning. It is good to see you on this uh, cool, long weekend. Glad that you're here. Glad not all of us went out of town, and uh, glad that you're here this morning. Two weeks from today, we'll be holding nominations for new deacons. You'll be given a, a ballot that has the names of all the men in the church who have been members for at least a year. And Dr. Coward, our moderator, will give you time to make your selections, and then we'll pass those in, and a co committee from the um, deacons will handle those confidentially over the next few months as the, the nominations are discussed, and the people who are nominated given a chance to consider the service in the church, and then over time we'll have an ordination service. So over the next two weeks, we need to think about who are the people that you would nominate? Who are those who care about the church? The early church, you remember, as they formed in Jerusalem, the members of the church went and sold all that they had and gave it to the apostles. They sold their land, they sold their houses, they sold their businesses. It says they held everything in common. And then the apostles took the common gifts and repaid the congregation so that they might live. Now, it wasn't a system that lasted very long. They soon began to realize that when people sold their houses, their land, and their businesses, they no longer had income. So they really were dependent fully upon the life of the church to meet every physical need. So over time, the church went back to the idea of tithing. 10% of your income from your business, from your farm, from your employment back into the ministry and the life of the church. You hate to say it, but the church learned early on the painful lesson of a Ponzi scheme. You've got to have more coming in than you have going out to keep it afloat, and the church couldn't do that. But in those early days, the problem of language arose. In the church, the widows who spoke Greek believed that the widows who spoke Hebrew received more attention from the apostles. The Greek-speaking widows believed that the Hebrew-speaking widows were getting more attention and more goods and more services from the apostles. And they began to complain. The apostles don't take care of those of us who are Greek. And the Hebrews said, we didn't know there was a problem. And so the apostles listened back and forth to the two groups of widows, and they said, do we need to take away time from ministering the word of the Lord to take care of waiting tables? And so they decided to allow the church to select deacons. Reading now from Acts, Acts chapter 6, verse 1. Now during those days... When the disciples were increasing in number, the Hellenists, those who are the Greek speakers, complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. And the twelve called together the whole community of disciples and said, It's not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait on tables. Therefore, friends, select from among yourselves seven men of good standing, full of the spirit and of wisdom, who we may appoint in the, to the task, while we, for our part, will devote ourselves to prayer and to serving the word. What they said pleased the whole community. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, together with Philip and Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. They had these men stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word continued to spread, and the number of the disciples increased greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Now the problem in the text is that the women, the widows, are not being equally served, or the perception is that they're not being equally served. And the Greek widows feel like they're not getting as much attention and as much food in the distribution as the Hebrew-speaking widows. So a voice rises up that the apostles are not fair to the Greeks. And they decide to get together and put their heads together and say, well, this is a task that we'd like to pass on to somebody else. So let's, 
let's let the church decide. In a democratic process, the apostles didn't choose the deacons, the committee didn't choose the deacons. In a democratic process, the church was allowed to choose seven men to be deacons in the early church. And they were to be people of good standing, full of the Holy Spirit, and wisdom. They were to be men of good standing. Now, I have a hunch when I say the words deacon should be in good standing, that means something different to just about everybody in this room. For some of you, good standing means it's somebody who's responsible. For others of you would say it's somebody who pays their bills. Some of you would say it's the person who shows up on time. Some of you say it's the person who participates. Some of you would say the good person in good standing is someone who's well thought of by everyone. Someone who contributes to the life of the church. The deacons were to be of good standing. So, trying to figure out what good standing meant, I looked up the Constitution for the Lions Club and the Rotary Club and found out that good standing means your dues are fully paid and you participate depending upon the club either from 50% of the time in attendance to 75% of the time in attendance. Well, that doesn't help us much because, well, it doesn't help us because we don't publicize what you all give. So you don't know who's caught up on their dues or not. Nor do we publicize every individual's attendance records. So the Lions Club and the Rotary Club don't help us very much when it comes to selecting deacons. I suggest when thinking about those who are in good standing, think about those who are involved, who are engaged, who are helpful, and positive about the life of the church. You can tell who loves the church by their participation. You can tell who supports the church by the positiveness of their attitude. You can tell the people who are in good standing by their supportive nature toward the church. A few months ago, we sent a crew to muck out houses in Nome, Texas, Raynell Bambert's hometown that had been flooded by the rains of Hurricane Harvey. And we sent a group down, and when they came back on a Wednesday night, the group gave a report. And I remember what Kevin Morris said about the church. He talked about for weeks these people had been living under the hardship of the flooding. Some of their, them are, their homes had been flooded, their homes had been destroyed, their property had been destroyed. But every morning they were down there at the church making coffee, cooking breakfast, and getting the day ready for the volunteers and the people who are going to be coming to the church. Kevin said, it is a church of people who are showing up. Kevin, did I quote you right on that? People who are showing up. And by their showing up, they demonstrate their love and their care and their attention to their church. I would suggest to you to think about that when you think about those who are in good standing. The second characteristics that the apostles gave the church was full of the Holy Spirit. That is, there is within their lives an evidence that God is at work. Hubert Drumright says that the full of the Holy Spirit means it is a recognition that this person is yielded to the work of God and the work of Christ within their lives. In the, old, in the, in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit comes in three ways. It comes as a secondary act of faith. It comes when the apostles lay hands on certain people. And it comes when certain people believe. If you ever want to know the history of why there are so many denominations, you can look back to the book of Acts and see those three ways that the Holy Spirit comes. And you can find every denomination holds to one of those three positions. That's how we learn to splinter ourselves into so many denominations. Some who said the Holy Spirit comes secondary. Some who said, no, the Holy Spirit comes when someone lays hands on you. And others who say the Holy Spirit comes when you believe. We Baptists fall in the tradition of believing the Holy Spirit comes upon us when we believe. 
and the apostles said, look for the people who are filled with the Holy Spirit. That is, there is a yieldness in their life to the work of God and the work of his ministry in and through the church. You can see in their lives that they've been filled with the Spirit and that God is working through them. The third characteristic is that they are full of wisdom, good standing, full of the Holy Spirit, and full of wisdom. A few weeks ago, we walked through Solomon's Proverbs chapter 1, and Solomon said, fools are drawn to scoffing and resistant to knowledge. And he talks about how fools choose paths that are leading toward calamity and destruction, and they know it, and they still choose those paths. Whereas the wise person chooses the knowledge that leads toward God and God's work in our lives. And I would go back to what I said in that sermon in Proverbs 1. The person of wisdom pays attention to the little details in their lives. It's not the big decisions that shape us. It's the small decisions that shape us. We're shaped in the back of the classroom when taking a test and the teacher picks up a memo from the principal to read it, and her eyes are covered while we're taking the test. Do we look around? Or do we put our knowledge on the paper? Those are shaping moments. We're shaped when you live in a small town and you see the highway patrolman going east and you know you're going west. We're shaped by whether or not we're going to be honest when we know we're probably not going to get caught. Full of wisdom. Those are the decisions that shape us. And Paul said, when selecting the deacons, look around for those who are supportive of the life of the church. Look around for those who are full of the Holy Spirit and you see God's working in their lives. And look around for those who are trying to live their lives in accordance with God's word and integrity. Those three things. Good standing, full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom. And then they name the seven. Stephen, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas. Not that it matters. Not that it matters. But all seven have Greek names. All seven deacons have a Greek background that shows some sympathy toward the Greek-speaking widows who were having trouble in the church. Not that it matters, but I, I find it interesting that when the church had a problem, they named those who had a sympathy toward the problem. Greek-speaking deacons. To complicate matters just a bit, too, we never have any historical record from the book of Acts that anybody actually waited on tables. It seems that the deacons came along and did almost exactly what the apostles were doing. They just spread it in a different way. In the very next chapter, we're told about Stephen, who was full of faith and the Holy Spirit, is called before the Sanhedrin for the council of heresy and following Jesus Christ, and he's asked to give an account of his faith, and he begins with the most eloquent speech in the New Testament. He begins with Abraham, and he talks about how God had worked through the faith of Abraham, up through the Exodus, delivering his people, through Joshua, giving them the land, through the kingdoms of David and the grandeur of Solomon, and the wickedness of the people against the prophets. And then he says, you are a stiff-necked people who do not trust in the Lord and in his son, Jesus Christ. And the Jews carried Stephen, the very first deacon, out into the streets, and they stoned him to death. So if you need to be eliminated from the list of deacons based upon Stephen's ex example, we'll understand. He didn't wait on tape. He was a bold witness for the faith that stood before the Sanhedrin and said, here is Jesus Christ. Philip is listed second. 
Philip is prompted by the Holy Spirit to take the road from Jerusalem to Gaza. It is a wilderness road, a difficult road. And the Holy Spirit encourages him to take that. And he, as he's traveled along the road, he sees a chariot being pulled by two horses, an Egyptian chariot with an Ethiopian eunuch standing in, reading from the scrolls of Isaiah. And Philip runs along beside the chariot. Maybe that's a characteristic of a deacon, the ability to run along at the speed of a horse. Something to consider. You know, y'all are not laughing very much. And that, that's funny right there. When I think about Dr. Cowart trying to keep up with a horse, that's funny right there. <laughs> Philip runs up along the chariot, and he asks the eunuch, do you know what you're reading? And he said, I do not. Philip joins him in the chariot, and he's reading the passage like a sheep. He was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb silent before the shearer, so he does not open his mouth. And the Ethiopian asked Philip, he said, who's he talking about? And Philip said, he's talking about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And he gives witness to the story of Christ in the life, in the fulfillment of the scripture. And the Ethiopian says, I believe. And he stops the chariot beside a pond and he said, look, here's water. What keeps me from being baptized? And Philip said, nothing. And Philip gets out, and he baptizes the Ethiopian eunuch in the pond. The Ethiopian eunuch gets back into the chariot with the scroll of Isaiah, and the Holy Spirit pushes Philip in a different direction. He did not wait tables. He is instead an extension of the apostolic ministry. Now, Prochorus became a, an apostle of John, and that's about as much as we know about him. Timian, Parmenius, and Nicander have been lost to history. But Nicholas, Nicholas, I'm sad to say, we know a lot about. John mentions Nicholas in the book of Revelation in the second chapter when he is talking to the church at Ephesus, and he says, you too hate the Nicolites as much as I do. Speaking for God. The church at Ephesus hates the Nicolites as much as God hates the Nicolites. And then we find all the church fathers for the first 400 years in the life of the church speaking against the Nicolites. And in Scripture, we never have any indication of what the Nicolites have become, but the church fathers tell us that they become anti-law. And most of the time when people become anti-law, they become anti-law against the sexual morality that's spelled out in the Old Testament. Nicholas becomes the deacon of free love. He says, we have been saved by grace in Jesus Christ. The moral laws do not apply to us any longer. The rules of marriage and morality and sexual morality do not apply to us any longer. And Nicholas begins to lead a fashion of people against the law of influence in the face of sexual immorality. And he's a deacon. One of the first seven. I hate to tell you this, but ministers and deacons live by different standards. Now, you're, the deacon's glass house might not be as transparent as the glass house that, that we live in as staff members, but deacons do live in glass houses. Why well, coach out of the little league and kick helmets and scream at referees and people in the stands and say, oh, he's just so competitive, he loves those kids, he wants them to win. You let a deacon kick a helmet and scream at a referee or an umpire, and they'll say, and he's a deacon at First Baptist Church, acting like that. That's Nicholas's leg legacy, the one of the seven who was in good standing, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, and became a heretic. Being a deacon, being a minister, being an apostle doesn't guarantee you no mistakes down the road, but it does guarantee 
that we live our lives under a bit of scrutiny and observation. As Garrison Keeler says, if the pastor in Lake Wobegon were to stand in the pulpit and say, I am only human, everyone's thought would be he has had an affair. And their second thought would be with whom and for how long? <laughs> because that's the nature of the glass house in which those who lead the church live. The apostle said, choose seven people. Choose people who are of good standing, full of the Holy Spirit, and wisdom. If you'd allow me to sum those up, I would suggest look around for the people you believe who care for the church and care for you. Look around for the people who you believe care what's going on in your life, who would come when you're in difficulty, who would help you when you're sick, who would assist your wife, your family, upon your death. Look around for the people you believe will care. Fred Craddock was doing an interim pastorate at a church, and he had an afternoon appointment to do an ordination service too many miles away. So he finished the service, he said amen, he ducked out through the back, and he went out through the choir room to get to his car as quickly as possible. And there was a lady in the choir room taking off her robe, and he said to her, that's a beautiful anthem this morning, I really appreciated it. And she said, well, I'm glad that's the last one. She said, what do you mean that's the last one? She said, that's, are, you, are you retiring? She said, no, I'm quitting. She said, why are, you, why are you quitting? She said, I'm fed up with it. He said, I'll tell you what, go home and take an aspirin and take a nap. When I get back to town, I'll, I'll call you. So he went, finished the afternoon service, and drove back to town thinking all the way, what in the world is so bothering to her? Got back to town, he called her, and asked her if he could come over, and she said, sure. And he went out and sat on her porch and drank coffee and argued about why she was so upset. She said, it dawned on me this morning, standing up there in the choir, looking out at those faces, nobody cares. Said, you stand up there in that pulpit. You see those faces. You look out on those people. You know they don't care. They don't care at all. And he said, oh, they do care. She said, you can't tell it. He said, oh, yeah, they care. He said, I travel all over this country. Everywhere I go and every church I stand in, there are people who care. She said, name them. He said, oh, you want names? She said, yeah, I want names. I want names of people who care. She wanted names. That's what we want. Two weeks from today, we're going to ask you for names. The names of the people you believe are in good standing, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, and who care. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, over these two weeks we ask for your leadership the guidance and prompting of your Holy Spirit. Lead us, Father, to recognize from among us those who have those three characteristics the apostles gave and who care about this church. Help us, Father, to see it in their, their lives and their service. Help us to recognize it in their commitment. Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit, help us to see those 
who could play a role in the caring and the nurturing of this congregation. Father, we thank you for this hour of worship. We thank you for how this passage of Scripture nudges us to consider our own faithfulness, our own service. And Lord, in this time of commitment, we ask that your Spirit speak to us about matters of faith, about matters of ministry, and matters of serving you. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn of invitation today is our My Faith is Found a Resting Place. We encourage you in this day to step forward and say, I believe Jesus Christ is Lord. To come and join with the fellowship of our church. If you have a need in your life you want to pray about, you come this morning. Let's stand. Let's sing together and you come as the Spirit leads you.